Good morning, church family. Can you hear me? Amen, amen. Well, we all hope you've had a great week. Today's a special day as we have four to be baptized. Amen. Give the Lord praise. Amen. Amen. Listen, baptism is an important step in the journey of a believer because it is an opportunity for believers to make a public profession of their faith in Jesus. Through baptism, we identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe baptism is an outward act symbolizing an inward change. It is an act of obedience displaying the forgiveness we have through, received through Jesus and our commitment to live in His ways. Church family, a couple of weeks ago, we had a glorious day with the Lord, moving in a mighty way. After Brother Keith preached and shared the invitation, Amy Murphy responded and came down the aisle and got things right with the Lord. Praise to God. Praise God. Repenting of her sins and confessing Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Well, the story gets even better. I want to share just briefly what happened that day. Later that evening, her son Dylan called, uh, who, who works with Dan Reeves, called Dan and shared how he felt and how the Lord was working in his heart. And, also, and, and Dan got Brother Keith on the phone, and they were able to have a three-way conversation with Dylan, who gave his life to Christ on the phone. Amen? That's awesome. Yes. Well, Dylan's wife, Nikki, some years back, gave her life to Christ, but did not follow through with believer's baptism. So today, she's also going to make that public. Amen? And also, that same Sunday morning in the back of the children's hall, Miss Lori was talking to little Hudson Howell, who has been asking a lot of questions, and led him to the Lord. So such a great day, uh, and the families have asked if Brother Keith and myself both could help out this morning, so we are honored, to, of course, to do so. And I will begin with Amy, and then we will transition with Brother Keith we'll, with uh, doing the baptisms of the others. We're so excited with... Uh, Amy and Jonathan and their family, you know, at Chapel Hill. And, and Amy, I know the Lord's going to do great things for you guys and, and excited to watch him work. And I want to just baptize you this morning. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a lot going on right in here, y'all. <laughs> Those of you that have been back here, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of moving parts right here. Okay, Nikki, come on down. Praise God, he's good. Amen. You want to get by? Come on. Just squeeze by. See, I told you, there's moving parts. Don't fall in, Debbie. All right. It was awesome. Uh, it's always great when somebody gets saved, but to, to have uh, three folks saved on the same day and, and, and just all that the Lord did on, on that special day of church was uh, was a huge blessing. And, and I praise God that, that, uh, that he's moving that he's working in our church. Amen. Sometimes we get caught up on all the things that are not going well and lose focus on all the good work that God is doing. He's doing good work at Chapel Hill Baptist Church and we praise his name for it. Amen. All right. There we go. Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism. Raise the walk of your life. This is Dylan. I got to say, uh, the Lord has blessed us along the way to see a lot of people uh, pray to ask the Lord to save them. And, and I told my Sunday school class this morning, you know, there's nothing better to see somebody cross from death to life and see that person pray to ask Jesus to save their soul. Uh, out of the, the, the years that, that the Lord has blessed me to preach and teach, I've never uh, had that experience over the phone. But uh, when, when Dan called and, and we, we talked with Dylan over the phone, uh, to hear Dylan pray a prayer of salvation and, and ask the Lord to save him was, was uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful phone call. Praise God for it. Amen. All right. Dylan, have you asked Jesus Christ to save you? All right. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism. Raise the wall from the rock. This is my guy Hudson right here. Come on in here, man. He's, <laughs> he's floating. 
This will be an easy one. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad he didn't like do a do a, a, a cannonball into the uh, into the rapture. But uh, beautiful, the Lord is working, and as I said earlier, and, and to know that that Hudson gave his life to Christ in the back while the Lord was saving souls out here, uh, what a blessing, y'all! Praise God, it's, it's awesome. All right, Hudson. Hold on right here, buddy. Yeah, there we go. Hudson, have you asked Jesus Christ to save you? Yes, sir. Okay, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism and raised the walk. Amen. Church family, God is indeed uh, on the move. He is working here at Chapel Hill. What an incredible way to begin a worship service. Let me invite you to stand before we worship in song, in spirit, and in truth this morning. And I hope you've come to do that. I hope you've prepared your hearts to worship. Let's take just a moment and uh, and be an encouragement to one another. We're here amongst brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, church family, find somebody you don't know. Greet them in the name of the Lord. Give someone a hug or a handshake this morning. And then we're going to continue worship. <coughs> Susanna, who is one of our own, Susanna 
um, is going to be speaking along with Jen Kish and then Rachel, who is also one of our own, and Megan will be leading worship that day. So that's going to be something that you all, I encourage the ladies to be a part of. I'm going to pray for us and then we'll continue with worship. God, thank you for this day and thank you for allowing us to be able to come into your house and to worship you, Lord. God, we praise you for those people who have made decisions that were baptized this morning, Lord, the decisions to follow you. And Lord, we thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross. Lord, as we continue to worship you, help us to remember who you are and, and why you were on this earth. In your name I pray. Amen.
these baptisms and what God is doing. Um, right now, if you'll just take those buckets that are in the middle and pass them towards the outside and so we can collect the offering. Um, we're going to sing a new song this morning. Um, actually, uh, I text Greg this week, maybe Tuesday, and I was like, hey, I knew Mark was preaching. I was like, do you think we could do this? Do you think we could pull this off? And he was like, yeah. And, and so I, that, I think the Holy Spirit had it working there. Um, we hope it comes together this morning. That is our prayer. <laughs> anyway, um, and so I'm going to read scripture. Oh, wait. And um, you're probably going to say after I read this, what in the world is she talking about? Okay, so from this morning, it comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. It's um, when King Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me. If by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as, they, as you killed them. And Elijah was afraid and he fled, he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went alone into the, alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and he slept under the root tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and he said, Get up and eat. He looked around there beside his head, and there was some baked bread on some hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank, and he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and he touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, for the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up, he got up, and he ate, and he drank. And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And you're thinking, probably, what in the world is she talking about? That's so depressing. So I just want to say that there comes a time in our lives that where everything is not all sunshine, it's not all puppies, it's not all rainbows and unicorns like we want it to be. And we get to a point, just like... I can say this because I was sitting right there over a year and a half ago when my father passed away. And I'm thinking, God, what's going on? I think I'm living the way you want me to live. I'm praying. I asked for him to live. He didn't live. And three months later, exactly, I was diagnosed then with multiple sclerosis. Just three months after my dad died. And I would defiantly sit in that chair up there and not worship God, knowing what the Lord Jesus Christ had done for me. And even that with Elijah being up on that mountain, this man, it was no secret. He knew how to pray. He prayed for a drought to come and it stopped for three and a half years. He prayed fire down on a sopping wet offering and God lit it on fire. So I'm telling you this more just to encourage you. There's going to be times that we have to get up and we have to pray and we have to eat. And this is how we get fed. And we have to worship him because even when things don't look like they're going the way we want them to, God can turn it around. And even if he doesn't turn your situation around, he can change your attitude and how you view it. Because through God, he works all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And now I'm going to try to sing after all that. <laughs>
what a powerful yes. Amen. Church, you believe God's working here? I mean, it's so uh, just the evidence of what God is doing every uh, every week. Is <clears throat> I appreciate so much what Brother Keith said this morning. Just we do get sometimes distracted by you know the negativity of certainly the world, the challenge of our circumstances, whatever. But um, we have to recognize the movement of God amongst His people. And it is so <clears throat> such a privilege to be a part of that. And I feel like after a worship service like that, after four baptisms, that I don't even need to get up here and preach. But I walked all the way up here, so I'm gonna, we're going to go. We're going to go ahead and look at the word. I'm just kidding. But we do have a lot. We do have a lot uh, <clears throat> going on in the service this morning. It's uh, it's going to be a uh, we've got a great ending to the service too. I'm excited about that. And I will try to speak. Uh, briefly, we're going to be in Luke chapter 22 this morning, and um, just recognizing again what what God does in the life of a believer, what God, the celebration of new life, uh, as, as Brother Keith said, and Brother Mike, they celebrated in baptism, and we see how God changes the life of a disciple. And we've talked, we talked about Peter over the last few weeks in, <clears throat> in a multitude of contexts. Um, and we're going to look at that this morning, the challenge of being called to follow Jesus. I spoke about that uh, a little bit a few weeks ago. Uh, Brother Keith preached on uh, the, the faith of Peter as he was walking on the water. <clears throat> we're going to look uh, this morning in the frailty of a disciple. And three times. Three times on the night of his arrest, Jesus told Peter, you will deny me before the rooster crows. And this must have sounded, this must have sounded unthinkable to Peter. Don't you agree? Because we know if there's one thing that we recognize in Peter, it was his passion for his love and his love for Jesus. Jesus, Peter loved Jesus passionately. And it was, in fact, John who tells us in his gospel account that it was Peter who drew the sword. You remember when the, they, the uh, soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the garden? And it was, it was Peter who drew the sword and cut off the ear of one of the soldiers. Jesus healed him. But we can see the passion and the love that Peter had for Christ. So how does a disciple Seemingly as devoted as Peter, go from devotion to denial in a matter of hours. <clears throat> and how can we, as we look at this example in Scripture that God clearly wanted us to see, all four Gospels record this. God clearly wanted us to see that. How can we look at this example of human frailty? And use it as a lesson in our own pursuit of Jesus. Let's look at the scripture together. Luke 22. We're going to begin reading in verse 31. And then we're going to skip around just a little bit. But beginning uh, Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon. He uses his pre-Christian name here. Behold, Satan demanded to have you. And you might sit you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. When you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. Jump down to verse 54. Here's the arrest. Then they seized him, talking about Jesus, led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. Verse 55, and when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I do not know him. 
And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Let's pray. Father, thank you for preserving your word. God, as we look at this, may we receive instruction. God, may we be, uh, be warned uh, so that we may not fall into the same temptation, the same trap as Peter. God, grow us, strengthen us through the power of your word. Glorify yourself in me as I humbly uh, speak the truth in scripture. Stir amongst your people this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The word here for deny that's used in the New Testament, it's the opposite of the word confess. So we are to confess Christ as his disciples. And we see, see here an example of Peter doing the opposite of confessing Christ. He's denying Christ. And a few weeks ago, we looked at the condition that Jesus placed on those who want to be his disciple. You remember that? He said, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow uh, me, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. So how does a disciple... Deny Christ. And what can we see from Peter's behavior that might help us understand his shift from devotion, supreme devotion to Christ, just moments earlier, to denial? <clears throat> well, briefly, I think there are three things that we can pick up on in this account to give us, uh, to give us a clue to that. First, we see here that Peter is boasting in his own faithfulness. Look at verse 33. Peter's response um, to Jesus was, Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And then Jesus said, Peter, I tell you, the rooster not crowed this day until you have denied me three times. There is such a contrast in that. There's, there's almost a note of, of humor in that. I mean, this is like, this is like some of my boasts that, that I'm about to go no car for six weeks. And Heather's like, Mark, Mark, you'll have a biscuit for breakfast. <laughs> or three biscuits in this case. But that's, that's kind of the absurdity of this. P Peter's claiming his devotion to Christ. And, 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 and Christ is saying, look, Peter, you won't even make it till the morning. And you're going to deny me not once, not twice, not three times. And this attitude of Peter's, it may not seem that significant on the surface. But church, this is exactly where Satan would love to get us. This is exactly the, the place that Satan is trying to get us. And that is when we are overly confident in our own faithfulness. Where we are trusting in, in our abilities under adversity. Where we're not leaning into God, we're, we're trusting ourselves. Because that's pride. Is it not? And the verses just before this, we didn't read that, but the verses just before this, the disciples were arguing, arguing over who's the greatest. It's pride. It's pride in their hearts. And that's the whole platform of the devil's campaign. He was active here in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was active. He was demanding that to, to Jesus, I mean, that's, that's pretty bold, but he was demanding to Jesus that, that he could sift Peter like wheat. He was active in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was active in the Garden of Eden all those years before. The same platform. 
doing the same thing, trying to appeal to the prideful hearts of men and women, convincing us to lean on our own understanding, trust in our own abilities, building up confidence in ourselves and slowly weaning us from reliance on God. That's what Satan does. So at the right time, when he gets us in that position, he can pounce. The devil, we, we say this uh, a lot, but I wonder if we remember who wrote these words. We say the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. That's scripture. Seeking whom he may devour. That's a warning to us. That's a reminder that Satan is active. The enemy is active and he wants to diminish the cause and the work of the church and the cause of Christ. Do you know whose words those were? Peter's. 1 Peter 5 8, he says, listen to Peter, listen to the transformation of, of Peter uh, that night on the night of his arrest, to Peter writing a letter uh, to the church as a leader of the, of the early church. Peter says in, in verse, 1 Peter 5, For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Listen to this. <clears throat> this is reminiscent of Jesus' words to the disciples that night in the garden. In verse 8, 1 Peter 5, he says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. See, as Peter grew in Christ, he recognized that a posture of humility was the true mark of a disciple. Because, uh, contrast Peter's self-confidence in verse 33 there with the prayer and attitude of Christ <clears throat> as he is praying in the garden. In verses 39 through 46, and I'll read this if you want to follow. Uh, we didn't read this a while ago, but it says, uh, talking about Jesus in verse 39, that he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you might not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and, and prayed. Look at this example of, of Christ's humility. Verse 42, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And what was the result of that? There appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed even more earnestly, and, it, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples, found them sleeping for sorrow, and he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. We see even Christ recognized the frailty in his, in his human nature. And he appealed to God for strength. And he received strength uh, from God in the form of an angel. But he was seeking God's will, leaning into God during a time of, of human weakness. And what a contrast that is from Peter and his bold claim of, God, I've got to, I'm going to follow you. To, you know, I'm here to, to go to uh, prison. I'm here to go to death uh, for you. But we see Jesus' response. It's one of humility. It's one of leaning into to God. So Jesus was, was boasting in his own faithfulness. Secondly, in verse 54, we see that he was following from a distance. It says, then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. Now, church, we're not trying to pick on Peter uh, this morning, uh, because Matthew and Mark tell us that, um, that all the disciples fled. When they came to arrest Jesus, that they fled, and that was fulfilled the prophecy when they will, they will uh, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And they all fled uh, when, when they came to arrest um, when they came to arrest Jesus. And it's John that tells us it was only Peter and one of the disciples that even followed Jesus at all. 
So that's, that's certainly commendable. But even though Peter may not have chosen to distance himself from Jesus, I mean, the circumstances may, I don't know, he might could have, uh, he might could have remained by his side, but the circumstances somewhat dictated the distance there. But either way, we see a, a, a momentous, momentous shift in his devotion to God compared to when he was close to Jesus in the garden. Do you see that? Christian, our loyalty, our loyalty to, uh, to Christ, our devotion to Christ is directly related to our proximity to Christ. That is, when we are in fellowship with Jesus, as he designed us to be, that is, when we abide in Christ, as he commands us to do, he has our full devotion. And just like Jesus uh, had Peter's full devotion when he was in his presence earlier that day, that is how God has designed us to, um, to show our devotion to him. It's in his presence. And our presence, our closeness to Christ is going to reflect on our devotion to Christ. And when he drew his sword on the arresting soldier or when he was ready in his mind to go to prison or to death of Jesus, that's when he was beside Jesus. That's when he was closest to Jesus. But that distance, that, that distance between, between us and Christ, it creates room. It creates room for, uh, for other things. It creates room for doubt. It creates room for, for fear. It creates room for, in Peter's case, self-devotion. I mean, self-interest over devotion. So even though Peter may or may not have had a choice to remain by Jesus' side through the arrest and through the trial, we can certainly see a difference in the devotion of a disciple who is standing next to Jesus and a disciple that's following Jesus from a distance. See, we are, we are meant to abide in Christ. We are meant to remain close at all times. And our faithfulness to God, it depends on. Your faithfulness to God depends on your closeness to Jesus, on our proximity to Christ. So he was following at a distance. He was boasting in his own faithfulness. Thirdly, quickly, <clears throat> he was fearful of the cost. Look at verse 56. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he set the light and looking closely at him, said, this man was also with him. But he denied it. Saying, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else said, you also are one of them. Peter said, man, I am not. Then he was accused a third time. He says, man, I don't even know what you're talking about. A few weeks ago, when we looked at the cost of discipleship, we examined Jesus' condition that whoever wanted to be a disciple must, must deny themselves. Take up their cross, follow him. You know, Peter would have heard that teaching probably many times. Jesus was, was going from place to place, and he was teaching these truths over and over. And his disciples, especially his, his inner circle, would have heard the, these teachings many times. But now, at this moment, the cost was apparently too much. It was too real. It hit too close to home for Peter. So instead of Peter denying himself to serve Jesus, he was denying Jesus to serve himself. Because he was fearful. He was afraid. He was afraid of what it might cost him as a disciple of Christ. Look at the progression. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think that's it.
Sorry about that. So look at the progression here. As Jesus, uh, as Peter is accused, and he denies him three times. <laughs> you want me to just stop, Brother Dennis? <laughs> okay, thank you, Brother. I'm on the black mic. Sorry about that. Um, we're all family here, I think, so we're good. Um, <clears throat> but look at the progression here, church, as we see, um, as we see Peter working through um, his fear and his anxiety as he's being accused of following Jesus. So first he, he denies knowing Jesus, doesn't he? He says, I do not know him. Uh, in verse um, 57, he says, woman, I do not know him. Secondly, he denies the people that know Jesus. <laughs> not only, uh, Peter says, am I not associated with Jesus? I'm not associated with the people that are associated with Jesus. I'm not one of them. I don't know Jesus and, and I don't, I'm not one of the people that know Jesus. And then thirdly, he, he says, I mean, he, he claims complete ignorance in their accusation. He says, I don't even know what you're talking about. It's, it's like, well, what, this is, what's the absurdity of your ac accusation here? I don't know Jesus. I don't know the people that know Jesus. I don't even know what you're talking about. Now, this is the same disciple that just a few verses ago, uh, you know, some, sometime earlier that day was, was willing to go to prison, was willing to go to death, was, was uh, wielding his sword against the, the captors of Jesus. And look at the look at the transition that he has made from a devoted disciple to one who denies anything associated with Christ. Why did he do that? Because he was fearful. He was fearful of the cost. He was fearful of what it might because we we claim that church. I mean, we 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 would like to think that we will stand firm in our faith no matter what we face, right? I mean, that's our hope. That's certainly my hope that no matter what um, the world throws at us and, and that we see that increasing every day, uh, every year, and that's going to continue. But no matter the opposition the world throws at, throws at us, our claim and our belief is that we're going to be able to stand firm in our faith. <clears throat> but Peter believed that himself. At some point, the cost felt too great. And he was scared. He was afraid. The freedom that he was willing to give up, the, the life that he was willing to lose a few moments earlier, now he didn't want any part of the cause. He was fearful of that. So we see that, that Peter was, he was overconfident in his own faith, his own faithfulness. That he was following Jesus at a distance and that proximity to Christ changed his attitude and his devotion toward Christ. <clears throat> and that he was fearful of what association with Jesus might cost. So when we conclude looking at scripture, two of the questions that we want to ask are, what is this passage teaching us about God? And then secondly, in light of what we see um, a passage teaching us about God, what is it teaching us about ourselves in light of who God is, right? So when I examine this passage, I understand more and more that my flesh is weak. You know, not only am, am I capable of failing like Peter did, but I'm prone to it. I am predisposed to fail because of the sinful nature of my flesh. And like Peter, if we find ourselves boasting in our own faithfulness uh, rather than leaning into God, if we find ourselves following Jesus from a distance rather than remaining close, if we find ourselves fearing the cost of discipleship, then we're going to fail. Just like Peter. And I'm reminded when I, when I read this passage that the most devoted disciple is just hours away from denying that they even know Jesus. That's the heart that's still in me, the, the heart that's still in all of us. 
But while this is <clears throat> certainly this passage is an example of, of human weakness, more importantly, it's an example of divine mercy. So what does this passage, passage teach us about God? It teaches us that he is a God of forgiveness. It teaches us that he is a God of restoration, right? He's a God of redemption. He's a God of second chances, thankfully. I think some of our kids in here, I was talking to Miss Lori this week. You've got a little, uh, I appreciate so much that when the, when the kids are in here on the last Sunday of the month, Lori gives them um, a little packet that helps them kind of stay engaged in the worship service and <clears throat> allows them to, to do some things to um, to be a part of the, the teaching here, but also to help occupy uh, their minds. But you have a little, uh, I think the, the kids in here are parents, you've got a little rooster uh, to uh, to color. And what was the title of that? Because I, I almost used it as the title of my message. Uh, it was, you don't want to say it. I think it was cock doodle doo uh, Jesus Still Loves You. Was that right? Yeah, so that was... That was plan B for the title of my message. But that really, that is, that is the moral of this story. Yes, we see the human weakness in Peter. We see the frailty uh, that we're all prone to. But more importantly, we see the love, the mercy, the forgiveness of God. See, when Peter denied Christ the third time, Luke says immediately, this must have been a powerful scene if we could have witnessed this. He says immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And then Luke records this. Luke alone records this. Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Yeah, that's, that might have been his, the nonverbal communication that would have taken place. Between Jesus and Peter, the power that was in that look, and we don't know for sure, but you know, I really, I don't think it was a look of judgment or anger. It certainly wasn't a, a look of surprise because he had already told Peter exactly what would happen, right? So I think it was more a look of, of mercy. I think it might have been a look of, of forgiveness. That's what sent Peter, whatever, whatever emotion was in that look, it sent Peter running out and weeping bitterly. That may have been the turn for Peter to become the disciple, the leader of the church that we know. That may have been the turning point. So church, how can we respond to this passage that we may not fall in the same trap? Maintain a posture of humility. Know that the same frailty that caused Peter to stumble, it lives in every one of us. Rather than boasting in our strength, do as Paul says and boast in our weakness. That the power of Christ might rest upon us. Pray daily. This is what Jesus was telling his disciples. Pray continuously. He was urging them in the garden to pray that they may not fall into temptation. Recognize your weakness and lean into the unwavering strength of God, just as Jesus did. And we also need to recognize that Satan is actively trying to destroy us. Just like he begged um, to sift Peter so that he would fall away. Peter later wrote in, in his first letter that we read earlier that Satan is prowling. He is on the prowl. Like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But church, know this. We don't have to fear the enemy. We need to recognize that he is on the move. We need to recognize that he wants to render us useless for the kingdom. But we don't have to fear the enemy. We need to be watchful. But Peter says this in that same passage. In 1 Peter 5 verse 9. It says, he says this is responding to the devil. He says, resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to 
His eternal glory in Christ will himself, listen to this, restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter had experienced this verse that I just read in a very personal way. And that's the story for all of us here this morning who are in Christ. You've been restored, confirmed, strengthened, established. <clears throat> in just a few moments, we're, we're about to enter into a time of remembrance. For what the redemptive work of, of Christ has accomplished for us. The redemptive work on the cross. Church, verse 32 in Luke 22 is one of the sweetest pictures of God's mercy and forgiveness and patience and love for us. He says, Jesus told Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus standing there speaking to Peter knows that Peter is about to fail. He knows that Peter is about to deny that he even is associated with Jesus. And Jesus just fast forwards to the moment of forgiveness. He just, he fast forwards to the moment of mercy. And he says, and when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. When you've turned back to me, strengthen your brothers. Church, that is a picture of forgiveness. That is a picture of redemption. I'm going to ask the worship.